<laughs> It'll be hard. <laughs> you always be Jamie Carson to me. I know. It's so weird. So who all is happy it finally rained? Did what? <laughs> I said, who's all happy that we finally got some rain? <laughs> so. Oh, Penny. To me, it wasn't enough rain, but uh, some's better than nothing. Well, my grass was happier than it was. Oh. Hello, everyone who's just joining in. Thank you for joining us. We're going to get started <laughs> at a meeting around <laughs> you, know. you know him, don't you? And, uh, after that, we will begin. Uh, in the meantime, while we're waiting on everyone to come in, please introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, if you are, say, what part of uh, Harris County are you from? Uh, I'm from the uh, Spring area right now. Um, if you're new here, mention that you're a newbie and uh, everyone be kind. <laughs> uh, we're gonna give it about two more minutes and then we're gonna go ahead and get started. Also, if anyone would like a copy of today's slide deck, uh, the link will be regularly posted in the chat. So you can have a copy of all the information that we will be sharing during today's meeting. All right, everybody, it's 2.05. Let's go ahead and begin this. Uh, Bill, would you like to go ahead and take it over from here? Yes, sure. Uh, welcome, everybody, to our holiday weekend uh, edition of uh, our Revolution's regular meeting. Uh, you see before you the uh, members of the steering fleet, uh, John Floyd, Ruth Milburn, Latanya Whittington, Chuck Cruz, and Jeremy Scheid. Um, so we're the ones that put this meeting together for you. And we had uh, um, our sort of mission statement up here, working in the furtherance of economic, political, social, racial, and environmental justice through education, direct action, and political engagement. There we go. Oh, and here we are. Uh, hand it off to Scott. Thanks, Bill. Uh, so, uh, as you see before you, this is our treasurer's report. We have $2,383.13 in the bank, which is an increase of a little over $150 since last month. 
Uh, thank you to our regular monthly donors, myself, Linda, Andrea, Jane Ann, Layla, Andre, Clayton, Dylan, Charles, Ruth, and Jeremy. Um, very much appreciate those monthly donations. Um, we could use a few more. Uh, what you see on the screen now, if you look at the QR code on the right, uh, donate, that's donations to our chapter, which is the money that I was just talking about. That's what helps us to help our candidates to get progressives elected in Harris County. Um, so if you'd like to get your name on that list, that's the QR code on the right. If you would like to donate to Our Revolution National, uh, they focus more on national politics. That's the QR code on the left. Um, so thank you for helping us do what we do. Back to whoever's next. I guess I forgot to update the agenda. My bad, y'all. Uh, <laughs> in that case, surprise guest. Uh, can you uh, lead us in, Chuck, on who our guest speaker is going to be today? Absolutely. And very first, I want to make absolutely clear to everyone on the call that this is not Jeremy's mistake. This is my mistake. I was very late in getting our upcoming guest scheduled and uh, only very recently got confirmation. So that was all on me and not Jeremy's uh, responsibility whatsoever. We will plan better for the future. So thank you very much for y'all joining. We have an amazing speaker here with us today. Uh, so I went to a training session for candidates in, uh, a couple of weeks ago and drew Scylla and some of her awesome folks from cool. the Texas Votes came to talk to us and I was able to convince Drew to take time out of her very busy weekend to join us today. And now without further ado, I will turn it over to Drusilla to give us a bit of an update on what's going on with reproductive freedom or the very much lack thereof here in Texas. Drew, are you on the call? Yep, I'm here. Thanks so much, Chuck. Um, hi, everybody. I'm uh, Drew Tigner. I'm Deputy Director of Strategic Campaigns and Partnerships at Planned Parenthood Texas Votes. Um, really excited to be with you here today. I love dedicated advocates who are coming out to club meetings on the Saturday of July 4th weekend. So um, I see you and I appreciate you. Planned Parenthood Texas Votes, for folks who might not know, we're the C4 political and policy arm of the Planned Parenthoods here in Texas. Texas has three Planned Parenthood affiliates that provide healthcare in their communities. The Harris County affiliate is um, Planned Parenthood Gulf Coast. They're also over in Louisiana. And then we also have Greater Texas, which is Dallas to Austin to El Paso and then South Texas, which is San Antonio in the Valley. And so we at PPTV um, do all the political activity around, um, you know, not just abortion access, but women's health care, reproductive health care more broadly. Um, and we are, do our election activity and our lobby and work at the legislature. Um, I'm based in Houston, so I'm excited to be here. I um, love seeing fellow Houstonians and Harris Countyites um, getting involved. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's going on in the law in Texas. I love we're a small group. I'd love it if y'all would if you have questions, just interrupt me, um, you know, have it be more of a conversation than anything else. Um, but if not, I'll just, you know, go right through. We can do questions at the end as well. So as I'm sure everybody on the call has heard, um, it's a week ago yesterday, um, the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. Roe v. Wade was the case that gave us um, the right to abortion. It also gave us, is a part of a string of cases, but the privacy cases that give us other rights, like right to birth control, the right to um, anti-sodomy laws, um, or the right to overturn the sodomy laws, I should say, right to marriage equality. All those things are in the same um, vein of cases. And so I think it's important to note when we're talking about the overturning of Roe v. Wade, which is the first constitutional right that has ever been taken away, um, that this is now, you know, we're in new territory and not just with abortion, but with a lot of different rights that we all hold dear. Um, in Texas, it's, it's created a significant amount of chaos and there are two reasons for that. Um, the first is that we still have a 100 year old statute on the books 
um, a pre row statute is what the term of art is um, right now, where abortion was banned in Texas prior to Roe v. Wade. Texas gave us Roe v. Wade. You know, this is the law that was challenged in Roe v. Wade. Um, and it is still in the books. It was never repealed because um, the judicial branch doesn't repeal, they don't make law, right? They, in the same way that a statutory body, like a governing body would, they do say what the law is. So in this case, they said this law was, the Texas law was in contradiction with the constitutional rights. Um, so the law was stayed essentially indefinitely as a permanent injunction. Um, because the law was never repealed, there is a question about whether or not the law is in effect right now. Our um, attorney Gen general, Ken Paxson, says it is, uh, and he's fighting in court right now to get um, the Texas state court system to agree with him. And there's um, a group of folks led by the ACLU and Center for Reproductive Rights currently um, trying to say that the law was repealed by implication, meaning that you know, we have lots of laws on the books in Texas. We have almost 30 um, that regulate abortion. And um, several of those, one, they imply abortion is legal because they regulate it so much. But now with the trigger law, um, just the question is like, do these laws supersede the, the pre-row ban? Is it appealed, uh, repealed by implication? And so uh, we just got a ruling from a Harris County judge. It was a Harris County originated case on, I think it was Tuesday or Monday staying the law, um, saying that the law, um, the staying the, the criminal statute, saying that row, uh, that abortion was illegal. And then that was immediately appealed by the attorney general. And then we just got a ruling last night from the Texas Supreme Court. That's a procedural ruling, if y'all heard about it. On Twitter right now, I think a lot of folks are kind of confused about what it means. I'm still a little bit unsure, but it's a procedural um, law or saying that the Harris County judge, there's a question about whether the Harris County judge had jurisdiction. So we're still um, figuring it out. It's going through the court case, but right now, um, a lot of folks thought that abortion wouldn't be illegal right away in Texas, but um, we're not sure that that's the case and all providers have stopped care um, because of the fear for, of prosecution. I mean, these are not, the pre row law is a felony conviction, um, and as is what would be the trigger ban, which I'm going to talk about now. Unless anybody has any, I'll try to answer any questions about the lawsuit. I don't have a lot of answers, but if anybody has any, I'd be happy to try to answer them for you. We'll see how it goes. Go ahead, Scott. Uh, for the Texas law that may or may not be enforced now, are there any exceptions in that at all? Um, the uh, That's a good question. I, have, I need to go back and look. So it's hard to find these 100 year old statutes um, that you know, we clean up the statutes a lot, like over time and like a lot of these things end up falling out and you can't find it online easily. You have to go back to the old code books. I've seen um, summaries of the statute, but I haven't actually read the text itself. Um, I think it's in the lawsuit though, so I need to go back and look at it. Um, I think that there are exceptions, but not, I need to go, again, I need to go look at it. Um, but I will say it's a good segue to the trigger law, which will go into effect potentially in the next two months. Um, there are no exceptions for rape and incest in that law, and there are only exceptions for um, medical emergency, like saving the life of the patient. And so even if I, I'm pretty sure that the trigger law is more extreme, like more, it goes further as far as the regulation than the pre-row statute, but it's something I have to look up. But I appreciate that question. Other questions about the pre-row law that I can try to muddle through answer for you? If you do have a question, please use the raise the hand function just so everyone knows. Um, I'll keep going and if folks, you know, think of a question, please raise your hand. Uh, as I just alluded to, Texas also has another law on the books right now, just passed last year, um, which is the trigger law. So the law states that within 30 days of Roe v. Wade becoming final, or an overturning of Roe v. Wade becoming final, um, abortion will be banned in its entirety in the state of Texas. Uh, that includes, like I just said, no exceptions for rape and incest. There are exceptions for medical emergency, life of the patient, but um, 
there's no definition about what that means or when that would kick in, um, which is going to cause a lot of chaos and confusion within, it's already causing chaos and confusion with SB8, Senate Bill 8 was a six week ban, there was a medical emergency exception there, but lots of doctors don't know what that means or um, how to interpret it. And folks in the medical um, field as they should be are risk adverse. And so in this case with the trigger law, the punishment is if you get it wrong, if you interpret it wrong, according to you know whatever ends up happening, the punishment is a first degree felony potentially punishable by life in prison. So they're high stakes right now. Um, we're at a point where, you know, last week abortion, providing abortion was a fundamental right protected by the constitution. And within a few weeks, we're gonna be at a point where providing an abortion could put you in jail for the rest of your life. So that is, um, you know, we're in dire times and it's in Texas where have some of the worst laws in the state, uh, I mean, in the country uh, regulating what is basic healthcare. Um, and there's also civil penalties, the $100,000 civil penalty uh, to perform an abortion. And then it also means that it says the law, the trigger law says it's anybody who performs an abortion. It's not just physicians. So that's a situation where, you know, if you um, give somebody an abortion pill, um, then you would potentially be subjected to this, to these strict penalties as well. So it's not just physicians. Um, like I said, the law was only passed last legislative session. I feel like they passed the law not really knowing or feeling like they were going to be in the situation with this being the law because it's extremely unpopular. Only 11 recently with recent polling say only 11% of Texans believe that there should be no access to abortion without any restrictions. Um, that is not very many folks, right? 11% is, is a small amount of people. The vast majority of people we know believe abortion should be legal. Um, and vast majority of Texans believe that abortion should be legal, at least in some circumstances. And so this is, this law is very, very extreme, um, even for a state like ours. Any questions about the trigger ban? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, well, I'm going to kind of speak from someone from the 80s, you know, if you know that that was a total different era for that. Um, we had our decision and it was available for us. You know, the only thing that we had to deal with was um, the advocates protesting against and blowing up and burning down the buildings, you know, but it was absolutely our right to do so. You know, if that's what we decided to do. You know, I, it, it was just devastating to me when I heard about, you know, the downfall of the bill here. But you mentioned something about the trigger uh, in 30 days and that's in Texas, you know. Uh, I'm an advocate, as you can see, for cannabis reform. So you really, really have to do a lot of uh, protesting, advocacy, testifying, you know. So uh, what is your strategy? Uh, do you guys have a strategy together to get past this, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And it's, it's a hard one to answer right now because there is no short-term solution to this problem. Um, nationally, obviously, we would love for Congress to codify the rights protected in Roe. That doesn't look like it's gonna happen um, with the current makeup of congressional makeup. Um, we're obviously are no longer able to rely on the courts as a backstop, which we have been for a long time in, in the state of Texas when uh, these laws have passed. And so our, our solutions are long-term solutions. And I that's a hard, pill to swallow, I think for a lot of us, I mean, for me, especially as an advocate, I've been dedicated my life to fighting for this and I feel like I just lost, right? And it's hard, it's hard to come back from that type of, you know, it's a gut punch, but we don't really have a choice. We have to keep going on. We have to keep moving forward. We have to keep advocating for our rights and that's what we're gonna do. And so we have short, medium and long-term goals. Um, our short-term goals are to sustain the momentum through the summer into the election cycle, which is gonna be hard. You know, we, everybody knows how quickly people um, get distracted uh, in our, our fast-paced environment. 
Um, we need to support people who need abortions. Um, people are going to need care right now, every single day. People's real lives are going to be affected. This is not fundamentally to me, this is not a political issue. It's a healthcare issue, and people need healthcare right now. And so we have to support the people that need the care um, get to be able to get it. Uh, we need to destigmatize abortion in our communities. This is how we got here, right? We don't talk about abortion. We don't use the word abortion. We don't talk about sex. We don't talk about the outcome of sex. Like those are all things that are um, are are holding us back. The opposition in the situation uses the word abortion four times more than your average abortion advocate, and um, I know a lot of folks want to shy away from the word, but we have to reclaim it. We have to take it back. We have to continue to destigmatizing it in our communities, and we have to keep talking about it um, with anybody who will listen to us. More medium-term goals, you know, we're looking to close the gap in Texas in November. You know, we'd love to be able to um, get new leadership in the state, but even if that doesn't happen, we need to be able to close the gap to show that we have momentum moving forward. Right. Um, ban access in other states. We want to maintain access or, you know, maintain the trifecta at the federal level this year and into 2024. And more long-term, you know, we have to change our relationship to power. It's a lot of what you were talking about. You know, there is, you have to do grassroots things. You have to march, you have to rally, you have to testify. Um, you have to do grass tops things. We have to um, organize donors and businesses and all the folks that have uh, pull powers of um, levers of power in this country. To change our relationship with power overall, we need national protections for abortion access, and ultimately we need to um, amend the Constitution to ensure that they can't take our rights away from us again. And so, yeah, we have a plan. The problem is the plan is not to fix it in the next three months, right? The plan is to be in this fight together for a long time, and it's disheartening and it's scary. Um, and it's there's we're facing real uncertain times, but that's just, you know, the the fight we're gonna have to do together, unfortunately. I appreciate Thank the you. Other questions about the current law um, in Texas or what's happening or you know, kind of the future plan before I talk a little bit about what you could do now. Go ahead, Scott. It occurs to me that you know, what we really have to have over the next few months is a massive backlash um, because it's justified. And if there isn't one, then, you know, people are going to get the idea that we don't value this issue as much as we do. Um, you know, we, we need to give the other side a drubbing in November as a result of this. And that's the only thing that's going to put the crazies back in their holes. Um, are you seeing any uptick in, in enthusiasm? I mean, are, is, are the phones ringing more? Are the donations coming in? Is, is something happening? Well, we don't have phones anymore, but the, the medical, <laughs> you know, the theoretical phones, yes, are ringing. Um, yeah, I mean, there's an incredible amount of enthusiasm right now from folks who haven't been involved before, been more passive, folks who, you know, have, you know, we had, um, as Chuck mentioned, we had a, a, a Zoom thing on Thursday where we had couple hundred folks come on and so many of those people had never been to a Planned Parenthood event or who had never done anything active. We had folks stay on afterwards to chat about organizing in their communities and they, so many of them said this was the first thing that they'd ever done. They were so happy to be in community with people. Um, and I mean, you just see it. It's not just people signing up on our list and donating. It's also all over the place. It's we've, I've seen, I've, there's a rally on Monday, apparently being organized in Houston by somebody who's never organized a rally before. She contacted me last night asking for help. And I'm like, that's fantastic. It's great. We're seeing um, people all across the country really for the first time putting themselves out there to organize and to be empowered to stand up. And I think that's such an important point too, that, you know, Planned Parenthood and the rest of the allies and the abortion movement have been raising this alarm for a long time. And we've been trying to um, galvanize this level of enthusiasm for a long time, but it's really important that it's not just us, like, like having people and mobilizing people, that it's 
individual, normal, everyday folks who don't do this for a living feeling so outraged and also so empowered that they're going out and doing things like organizing a march for the first time in their lives um, in a week, which is stressful. I, I'm talking to her tonight, so I hope that it goes well. Um, so yeah, we're seeing an outpouring of support. I don't know if anybody's on TikTok, but TikTok is all abortion right now, which is um, great because we need the youth engaged for a long time. Um, the youth haven't seen abortion as a, an issue for them, right? It's it's not been um, something that has really piqued their um, advocacy interest in the same way as other things like climate, for example, have, but that's changing significantly. And it's because right, right now we're in crisis. And so there's, um, you know, there's, I don't want to say it's a benefit because it's not. I'd much rather have my right to an abortion than to have folks um, entering the movement in this way, but folks are getting involved and are engaged for sure. Go ahead. I'm curious if there have been any plans that you can help us out with regarding merchandising, something that will be priced so that there's money going into your coffers, but also that we can wear shirts or display flags that say, I love somebody who's had an abortion or something like that. Yeah, um, there has been a talk about doing um, a um, like a sign campaign or we have merchandise. I'm like, um, I'm going to go to the marketplace and go look up this thing for you. Uh, Planned Parenthood has merchandise online, but I think you're talking more about like a concentrated campaign. Um, we don't have not yet, but I, those are things that are, I think are on the table, especially more long term as we kind of think about um, how do people be more visible? How do we bust stigma? And I definitely think, um, you know, those types of things, people have feelings about yard signs. I know they do, but I like to see a good yard sign um, in people's yards and shirts and, and all the, the rest I know are a part of that incremental change that we need. So um, I encourage folks to go to the Planned Parenthood Federation of America website. If you want merchandise right now, they have it for sale. Um, also, ACLU, I, should not, I was previous ACLU employee. They have the cutest merchandise. I love the ACLU merchandise. I recommend looking up their store too. But um, if we do end up rolling a more like cohesive or concentrated campaign, I will certainly let y'all know. But we're sort of right now just kind of figuring out what the next step is on those kind of longer term, bigger picture type things. Fair question. Thank you for dropping that. Any other questions um, before I talk about how I would love for y'all to get involved? So we made this Google Doc because everybody's asking us, what should we do? Um, so we gave everybody probably too many things, right? We put together a list of like 15 things that you could theoretically do right now, not theoretically, actually do right now to get involved. Um, First is, I want to highlight that actually the second thing on this list, which is to participate in our 4th of July abortionist freedom campaign. Um, I'm going to go ahead and drop that link specifically in the chat. It's ab is freedom.com and we're going doing some old fashioned um, you know, you can print out a flyer to pay for your neighborhood. My mom who's 72 years old is going to is volunteered to do that right now in Montrose in her neighborhood, which is great. Um, you can obviously post online, you can, we have instructions for how to paint a banner that you can uh, drop or hang up or do whatever it is you would like to do with a banner. Um, you know, just different ways that folks can feel empowered over the 4th of July. I also just really love our graphics. It's 1970s feel because um, retro is back, but also in, in respect and um, harking back to the 1973 decision. So please, please, please. Promote abortionist freedom over the holiday weekend. Would hate for this cute graphic to go unnoticed, um, but also it's just a really great and um, you know six easy ways to get involved versus um, you know my second request or my second ask is a much bigger lift than um, printing out some flyers and passing them out. Uh, the the next thing that we're doing is we're launching a volunteer community captain program. Um, so that's going to be somebody in your neighborhood. I kind of been thinking about them as like abortion precinct chairs. These are people that are in charge of um, 
you know, ensuring their neighbors are informed, ensuring that their friends and families know how to get involved, um, get folks registered to vote, get people to know who to vote for, uh, work on GOTV um, campaigns, and really is an opportunity to be a leader in your community around this issue, which so many people really want right now. Um, I know folks, y'all are already leaders in your community, but if you know other people who want to get involved in this way and really want something tangible to, to hold on to, um, this is a great way to do it because it's old fashioned community organizing in a way that we know that works, right? Neighbor to neighbor, family member to family member, person to person is the best way to build long-term power. Um, and so the volunteer community captain program is meant to do just that. So I'd love for y'all to promote those specifically, those two things, the abortionist freedom campaign and the volunteer community captain program. Um, a part of the community captain program, we're doing the six part series, training series that folks who are, don't wanna be a captain can still come to get the information that they need. If you wanna be a captain, you have to come to all six. Um, we'll be recording them as well for folks who can't come at a specific time. But um, education is going to be the key to success here. You know, a lot of people are in the movement for the first time and don't know the first thing about doing kind of anything. And that's great, right? That's an important opportunity for us to um, educate folks, to get them involved, to get them into community organizing and to, you know, do more for abortion access in the state of Texas. So um, those are the two main things. Love for you to follow us on all of our social media, obviously, because Social media is where it's at. And then the other ways to get involved are through our national office, through our local, like I said, affiliates. We have three affiliates in Texas. Um, but this is our list right now. It's in a Google Doc because we can continue to update it. So as things change, as we get more um, things to do, we'll continue to update this resource guide for folks. Um, so if anybody's asking you how to get involved in at least with Planned Parenthood, this will be a great link for them over the next like several weeks to several months. Um, but again, volunteer community captain and abortionist freedom are my two main asks right now. Uh, any questions about that, thoughts, ideas, concerns? You know, if there's any plan for advertising to put up billboards uh, either by Planned Parenthood Texas or with contributions from folks in the field. Great question. Um, I love a good billboard campaign. Uh, we are doing like digital ads, uh, media ads, those types of things. Um, but I do, we have, we are considering um, newspaper ads, billboards, like the more traditional form of advertising as well. Um, so it's, that's a possibility on the horizon. But right now we're in the digital space, but I love billboards. I think that they're great and effective and um, a good idea. Other questions? I think that's all the questions we have now. Um, I just want to notice, I did take the link to the doc you share and place it in our slide deck. So if anyone who has a copy of our slide deck, they will also have a copy to the link of the doc you share. Thanks so much, Jeremy. It makes it easier to put everything in one spot. Uh, we do have a question from uh, Susan Cummings. Hey y'all, um, do you have any kind of um, materials that are in Spanish? Yeah, we do have Spanish materials. Okay, um, good. I can send it to you, Susan, if you want to drop your information in the chat. Sure, sure. I don't know if that one's readily available, but yeah, we have lots of Spanish materials. We're doing a Spanish language event in the RGB actually this um, month to talk about the importance of abortion access and abortion rights. Um, and we do a significant amount of Spanish programming in general. So yeah. Thank you. Uh, you know, any final questions for our guests? Drew, it's Chuck again. Um, so as a candidate for office, I'm gonna be out knocking hundreds, if not thousands of doors, well, definitely thousands of doors. Um, if there isn't already something in the works, I would love some sort of uh, bulk pack of buttons or something like that that I could offer to folks at the door. Yeah, happy to get that to you for sure. I will, we're about to do a giant swag order. Um, so I will uh, keep that in mind. And we're also 
you know, going to be considering printing other, you know, materials, door hangers, those types of things. I, I just want to uh, thank you for your hard work and dedication. And I just thank uh, Planned Parenthood, you know, because again, I do go back to my era. That's basically when Planned Parenthood started. And um, a lot of us really didn't know exactly what it did for us. Um, a lot of young ladies that couldn't talk about things to their parents, you know, uh, Planned Parenthood was there for them. You know, and I'm pretty sure you already know that the history, you know, and so as I see the activists, they're younger women now and which I'm glad to see you guys out there, you know, fighting for your right because it's our body and our choice and it's been that way, you know, and uh, I have a 16 year old daughter. So, you know, I want to make sure once I leave here, you know, that she still has the right to make her own choices and how she wants her life to be. It shouldn't be run by the government or just Texas itself, you know. So um, again, thank you. <laughs> and I really appreciate what, what you're doing. Yeah, thank you so much for those kind words. And I, I do want to leave you all with you know, the future of Roe is not the future of Planned Parenthood. We're going to be here um, fighting for our rights to abortion, but also giving folks access to the basic health care that they need um, and non judgmental information well into the future. And also, we know that Roe was never enough, right? That so many people didn't have access to abortion because of the barriers the state has put up. So um, we're here, we're fighting, we're going to keep fighting, we're in it for the long haul. Um, and I'm really happy and that I can, that y'all are standing with me in this fight. So I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Um, our next speaker, uh, Latanya Whittington, would you be uh, able to introduce our next guest speaker? Sure, well, I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker. Um, I know a lot of us are very, very excited. July, um, uh, some of us 14, 15, 16, the Texas Democratic Convention. And this will be actually my second one. I went to uh, the last one, I only stayed one day Friday. But there's been so much planning, so much things going on. And I'm excited, uh, like I got the quote from who I'm getting ready to introduce, put party back into the party. <laughs> so uh, what we're going to talk about is also a new caucus, is the Texas Progressive Caucus. And uh, I'm really excited about that. I'm, I'm on the board, so I've had a lot to do with the planning, but I must give it up to who I'm getting ready to introduce. He has worked day and night, probably into the next day, <laughs> putting this together. And uh, he's not feeling too good today. He, he has COVID and I'm gonna announce it first. Mm -hmm. But I, I really appreciate uh, Clayton Tucker, you know, to still come even though through his sickness. He is a true progressive warrior. So without further ado, I introduce you guys to Clayton Tucker. Welcome. Oh, well, thank you so much, LaTanya. <laughs> and if it's okay with everyone, I would like to keep my camera off because I probably look the way I feel. Um, but the fever broke today. Like this is my first day of no fever, so we're getting there. Um, so, so good seeing so many familiar faces. I'll do my best to, to keep this brief but we are going to have a really great time at the Texas Democratic Convention. We are gonna be having a progressive caucus. Now this is, we've had several progressive caucuses before. Um, in the past, they've been very stinted towards like an our revolution caucus, uh, but this year we really expanded the umbrella and we're pulling in um, a whole bunch of various groups. Um, PDA, several indivisible groups have been very active with us. Um, and a lot of like the Texas Grassroots Alliance members. So this is becoming a true organized coalition effort to build and strengthen the party. Um, so we are having two big events and both of them are uh, technically open to the public. 
<clears throat> so we are, of course, having our convention caucus. That will be Friday, July 15th at 9.30 a.m. Not the best time, also not, not the worst. Um, and we have all that information. We have a whole, whole, whole lot of um, fun activities planned. We will be hearing from several great speakers. Uh, Representative Ron Reynolds, I know, will be speaking about the Texas House Progressive Caucus. And by the way, shout out to our friend, uh, Representative Penny Shaw. She is a member of the Texas House Progressive Caucus. And we are going to be doing all that we can once the convention is over to make sure the Texas House Progressive Caucus is uh, a strong and formidable force uh, within the Texas legislature. So uh, thank you, Representative Shaw, for being a part of that. Um, and we will also be hearing from each of the party chair candidates, Gilberto Hinojosa, Kim Olson, and Carl Robertson, and we will be voting on who to endorse. Um, so that is all going on. Uh, we have several hundred RSVPs already, so there is a whole, whole lot of interest. And of course, um, as Latanya said, we got to put party back in the party. So we are having a progressive happy hour. And what's fun about this happy hour is so most things at the convention are not free. Uh, there's a lot of happy hours and things they have to pay to get into, but our thing is completely free. Um, so it is free. It is open to the public. That is happening on Thursday uh, for folks who are there. So we are inviting everyone. Um, we'll be just meeting at a little bar. That'd be kind of come as you are, uh, leave whenever you are ready to go um, and so forth. We are also going to be working <clears throat> to um, do a whole list of endorsements. So we, if you are running for a committee, whether that is rules or resolutions or a party officer or any of that, we are getting folks to um, apply for our endorsement. I think we are, whoop, um, I think we have about 20 endorsed candidates so far. We haven't publicly released their information yet, but we are planning to basically build a list that everyone who comes to our caucus um, will just basically get a list of, you know, all you have to do is find your SD number and then there are the progressives for you to vote for. Um, and of course, a lot of convention information. Our long-term strategy, and I'll just kind of end it with this, is that we need, we need power. Uh, we need we need to have it, and we also need to not be afraid to use it. There's a lot of Democrats. Um, I mean, they did seem timid about using power, while the Republicans basically use it to destroy everything, uh, including our democracy, just bit by bit by bit, and all of our freedoms. And we need to fight back. Um, so we need a Democratic Party that is much more aggressive, but also one that is, of course, very progressive as well. So we are building that out and building ways to really convert more and more folks, building and strengthening the party. Um, because when we have these great candidates run, these great progressives run, uh, we need to make sure that they have precinct chairs that they can work with. You know, when, with Chuck, you know, he as many precinct chairs as we can get him and many good county chairs as we can get him, that makes his campaign stronger. Um, so that is kind of our... That is our niche. That is our piece of the puzzle. And of course, we look forward to working with everyone. And I will hopefully see y'all at convention. And by the way, if you're going to the convention, uh, getting COVID is not allowed. So please wear a mask between now and the convention, because I know at least seven to eight people have it right now. So um, don't be like me. Mask up. Don't get COVID before the convention. <laughs> Okay. Well, I just want to mention at the happy hour, any candidates that's running, you have an opportunity to speak and give us your stance and whatever you want to talk about. So that's included. Um, that's the Thursday before the festivities. So I think that's a really great idea. You want to get you something to eat, kind of relax. Uh, this will be a great time to do it, to mix and mingle. Uh, and bring the party back into the party. Mm -hmm. uh, does anyone else have any questions um, to claim? And also, if you could um, put the links in the chat, that would 
that would work so people can sign up. Mm -hmm. All right, there we go. And again, if you all have any questions, um, always feel free to reach out to us. And I hope everyone's doing well. And for the delegates and other attendees, I hope to see you at convention. Okay, thanks, Clayton. Anyone has any questions, any questions for Clayton and about the convention and about the Texas Progressive Caucus? Okay, well, I'm going to give the mic back to Jeremy. And thank you, Clayton. Hello, Tanya. Um, I think our next part is your specialty. Okay, so I guess the mic is thrown back to me. All right. Well, um, from my last meeting, uh, it really seemed like it worked well uh, with my cannabis news is basically what I want to call it, or cannabis updates. And um, that's what I fight for every day of my life and what keeps me functional and well every day of my life is cannabis. And I'm pretty sure there's more people here that understands and also cannabis is used as a daily medicine for you. If you wake up and that day you need cannabis, then it's your medicine and it's important to your life, you know? So it's important to mine. So uh, what I would like to do each meeting is just kind of go over a few things that I've done some research on. And the first uh, research I did, which was very interesting to me was cannabis provides benefits for migraine sufferers. So I'm pretty sure, well, I deal with migraines. You know, if any one of us here deal with migraines, I want to share some information with you. So uh, it was a team of investigators. Now, this is with the University of Arizona, reviewed the findings of 12 previous published studies involving 1,980 patients, okay? And it was reported evidence of the plant cannabinoids. And that's uh, the THC that's within the cannabis plant. It has the ability to reduce the migraine frequencies and to abort the onset of migraine headaches. So it helps. Now the use of various preparation of cannabis. Now what they mean by that <laughs> is like flour, oils, if you're dropping oils, edibles, if you're doing concentrate or more, there's, there's plenty of ways to use cannabis. Was also associated with significant reductions of migraines that sometimes comes with induced vomiting, pain, and nausea. So if you do deal with um, migraines, sometimes you will get a stomach ache, you'll feel nauseous, and of course, dealing with the pain, whatever section of your head that is in, because migraine is just like not a headache. It's either sometimes on the left, on the right side. With me, it's on my right because dealing with uh, trigeminal neuralgia. Now, uh, the results of a prior literature review on 34 scientific papers on cannabis and migraines identif identified encouraging data on medical cannabis and the therapeutic effect on relieving migraines and all of the studies reviewed. So they really got some great information on that. And numerous surveys of patients report that those suffering from migraines often turn to cannabis for relief. And many patients say that it is more effective than prescription medication. So I think we can all testify for that. I won't say no. Maybe some of us can testify for that. Uh, well, uh, that's my first subject. Um, is there any questions about it? Or anyone want to share some thoughts or concerns or their experience? Uh, maybe if you have migraines and you use oils for it, like drops, you know, would you like to talk about it? The floor is open.
jump in real quick. Um, I've done this before, so you, some of you may have heard this, but I've been doing CBD for my chronic neck pain, uh, which has just a little, you know, I'm doing the Delta 8 gummies at night, and it makes all the difference, number one, in my pain, and number two, in my sleep. Uh, so I've only been doing it for a couple months now, but big fan so far. You may not need it now, but, you know, as you get older, <laughs> things happen, and... Uh, uh, you might need it more later. Well, thank you for sharing, Scott, uh, because it is that is a natural way that you decided to deal with, you know, your situation, your migraines, your headaches, your anxiety, maybe depression. Okay. Uh, also, let me suggest that keep using it because it's not something that you can use for like 30 days and then that's it. You know, you have to continually use it. You have to really actually start out using it for 30 days, all right? And then it's a continuation, you know. Uh, maybe after a while, you may have to go up a milligram, you know, or you can stay steady. It just depends on what your body can have your noise uh, need. You know, because we, again, I know I've said this before, our bodies are already, we're born with can cannabinoids in our bodies, in our system. And then once we consume it, of course, we're going to need more, but it's still like a healing mechanism. Uh, but I just wanted to share that with you. You know, you can't stop for a month and get back on. It's going to be like you're starting all over again. Uh, any other questions or anybody like to share? Okay. And throw it out there as a first time candidate. It is a heck of a lot to carry. And when I'm trying to go to sleep at night, my mind is generally absolutely racing with what I've got to be focused on the coming weeks. And half the time I would not be able to get to sleep if it were not for my Delta 8 gummy as well. So I am a big, big fan and user and proudly stand behind the products that I've been able to find. Thank you so much for sharing. And, uh, you know, Delta 8 is something that just started like almost a year ago because it has the forward feeling uh, just like THC, but it's still not THC. Um, people like me that deals with chronic pain, you know, the Delta A mixed with the THC would actually be a lot better. But for me, I have to use Delta A along with THC. Uh, oils with THC, and it's called a, a combination, full, full spectrum, I'm sorry, to where you have the CBD, you know, and the THC. But that's one thing Texas is trying to do. They just want to stay with the CBD, you know, and not add THC in anything, you know. But, you know, that's going to be something that we're going to have to fight. You know, um, in this next 88 legislation, cannabis legalization is going to be the big deal. <laughs> I've waited all of this time now, finally get my time to shine. And believe me, you will see me there. You'll see pictures, video, and everything. Uh, I'm working with the beautiful and wonderful Penny Shaw representative. I'm one of her liaisons, you know. So uh, it is real. Her and I will be working face-to-face, neck-to-neck on getting this thing done. And we're working on strategies together. And that's one thing that I have been praying for, <laughs> that I could get someone like her, you know, to join me and, you know, maybe we could get this thing done together and get Austin to actually hear. Well, we have to say, all right, that perfect bill that's going to help the Compassion Act, you know, that's the bottom line, because more, more diagnosis needs to be added. You know, there's a hundred neurological uh, diagnosis that's on there, but it comes to find out that my condition, trigeminal neurology, is not. And it makes me so angry because, you know, since 2017, I have been talking to them about my condition, trigeminal neurology, trigeminal neurology. And in and, and 2019, when they finally added those 100 uh, conditions, 
mom wasn't on there. So, you know, it's just not fair. You know, so that's the thing that you fight for. You fight for what you need and what is right for you, you know. Okay. I wanted to quickly talk about cannabis and liver cancer. Uh, Jeremy, can you go back to the slide? Um, before you go on to the next thing, we have one uh, member who's had their hand up for a while. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see it. Thank you so much. Uh, Susan Cummings. Susan. Please speak, Miss Susan. You're muted. We can't hear you, sweetheart. Miss Susan, you're, you're muted. Okay, I think I'm off now. Uh, I just wanted to provide my, my testimony about uh, CBD and cannabis, uh, both, because um, the Delta 8 has been really, really useful. Uh, it's been great after I come back from walking because uh, it helps with joint pain. Uh, and then um, just straight up THC has helped me with uh, coping with cancer. So it's like... Um, the, the stress of of having cancer um when i consume it's like a weight lifts off my body and i can reoccupy my my body and the the cancer is not is not an issue in my brain in my head anymore so i'm um i'm i'm going to testify if you need me to testify you know you can call on me but Latonya. Now, you know I will. You just said it, and you're on that list now, Susan. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you're one of the ones that's going to be on that bus with me uh, to Austin Capitol on Testimony Day. Uh, the thing is, we have to find the right bill for you. And we'll do that. So I really appreciate you, Susan, so much. You know, it takes warriors like us to actually stand up for it and tell our story. And your story is important. That's your story. And, you know, you're a Texan. So that means something. They need to respect your feelings, respect your right, what heals you and makes you feel better. You know, so you're one of the patients that, uh, that has to have the combo, you know, and that's okay. That is okay. So that's what we need to tell Texas in 23. So I would love to put you on the team. You're on the team. And thank you so much for sharing your story. You know, all of the stories are very important. Okay, so just next quickly, I'll go over actually what Susan was talking about, and this should be near and dear to her heart, uh, how cannabis, about cannabis and liver cancer. Uh, is cannabis consumption decreasing your risk of liver cancer? Data, scientific journalist says it is possible. So adults with a recent history of cannabis use, like if you've used it prior, are twice likely to be uh, diagnosed with, um, I'm sorry, hold on, I'm sorry. Adults with recent history of cannabis use are twice, are twice less likely to be diagnosed with cancer, okay? The most common type of cancer that you can think of. Uh, than those with no history of use, according to the data published in the scientific journal called Ceresis. So to sum that up is saying, you know, if you were and still are cannabis use, you're likely to have cancer, you know, and they did a data on it. So that seems it might be true. Now a team of researchers affiliated with the Cleveland Clinic and with Georgetown University Hospital in Washington, D.C. So these are the people that conducted uh, the scientific journals. Assess the relationship between cannabis consumption with over 1 million subjects. Okay, so um, that's a lot of people. Now, investigators reported that those who were currently cannabis users users were 
less likely to catch cancer. In any studies, there might be some doubt, okay? But of course, they will have doubt on cannabis. And I wanted to read the negativity to you, yeah, because I wanted to let you know how people still have this thinking, thinking, and they're really still not trying. They still want to see it as a drug, you know? And they said, due to the cross-sectional structure of our study, we were unable to draw a direct effect. Hence, we suggest prospective clinical studies to further understand the mechanism to which various activities, ingredients, particularly CBD and cannabis, may possibly regulate liver cancer development. So I hope I didn't read that fast, but it was kind of two things out of it. First, you know, they still not trusting already the scientific evidence that they have found that uh, cannabis does help liver cancer. It does. But then, as you see, they're leaning to the CBD. So, you know, that seems like that's the only way that people want to go. And I'm not saying CBD is wrong, you know, but for others, we want more, you know. So it seems like they're just leaning still again towards CBD. All right. So cannabinoids possess, possesses anti-cancer activity and cellular models of cancer. And it has been documented in the activity of cancer patients. All right. Um, this is all the information basically that I have on the subject with uh, cancer. And the more studies I find, uh, I'll share with the group. Okay. Uh, oh, one more thing. It also says that data shown an association between cannabis use reduces the risk of head and neck cancer, okay? Studies has also shown a great relationship between cannabis consumption and various types of liver diseases too, all right? So that's something else and uh, I'll be investigating more to share with you guys. Uh, so any questions about uh, what I found on liver cancer? Uh, does anyone want to make a comment? Anyone here in race, Jeremy? No, I don't see any other questions. If you're ready, okay. move on. Okay. So that's the end of that. Uh, now, Jeremy, uh, how was that timing? I wasn't keeping track. Uh, if I had to guess, maybe 10-ish minutes. <laughs> we have 10 more minutes. Okay. Oh, well, no. I, I misunderstood you. I thought you said how long did you take. Uh, in terms of our time <laughs> now, um, we just need to wrap up with a few uh, upcoming events and how people can get involved and then we're done for today's meeting. Okay, well, I just want to end my cannabis updates, but thank you very much, guys, for letting me share this. This is very passionate to me, and I know a lot can relate to this. Uh, the next time I come, I do want to discuss uh, Houston's first medical marijuana store. Uh, I plan on visiting them and seeing uh, what's the credentials you know, uh, what do you need so that I can share more information? And then also I would like to talk about testimonial uh, for cannabis reform. So thank you very much. And I'll pass it over to Jeremy. All right, so our next feature is, uh, we wanna hear from you, the guests. Uh, so this is our regular feature called Members Minute. This is a way for uh, members who come in, if there's any type of uh, civic action, civic updates, uh, organizations that maybe you volunteer with, upcoming events, any type of news that you want to share with fellow progressives, this is your time. Um, I'll go ahead and start it off. Um, aside from working with Our Revolution, I'm also very active with my teachers union, AFT. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention to everyone is, uh, please, we need y'all support at these school board meetings. Uh, there are I don't know who is organizing these book banners, but they are showing up in droves. 
Um, most school districts have already finalized their budgets. And this past school year, uh, every time the budget talk was brought up, it was being derailed by these wild accusations of uh, rumors in our school, uh, ban books that should be just banned from uh, the libraries. They're trying to dox information of our librarians. It, it is becoming ridiculous. And the problem is because they show up with so many numbers, most school districts have a limited number of people who can speak and they seem like they're the majority. This is just a loud fringe group and we need people to come to the school board to realize like, look, there are bigger actual issues that are facing on our school districts that we need to focus on. If you want to get involved, please, uh, Check the local PTA, PTO, local teachers union. Uh, they will definitely help you get some information. Um, I would also be happy to address you in a certain location, depending on what school district you are wanting to be involved in. I will be happy to help you with that as well. Um, is there anyone else who would like to share anything for the members minutes? Uh, please just raise your hand. Um, we have to keep it around a minute uh, going all right, so we got one from Susan Cummings. You have the floor. Hey there, I just wanna let you know that uh, Baytown, in addition to having its, its uh, I guess, two-year-old um, Baytown Area Democrat Club, we now have a one-year-old League of Women Voters. And so we are really working hard out here in Baytown to try to get our electorate more involved. Uh, the percentage of um, eligible voters who don't show up at the polls. We're trying to work to to make them see that it's really important to get to the polls. So um, yeah, those are the folks that I'm working with. Thank you for sharing, Susan. Uh, next we have Linda Phoenix. Uh, hi, can you hear me? All good. Great. Um, so in addition to my work with our revolution, this year I helped with the candidate endorsement uh, work in the early part of the year. But one of my key issues is uh, single payer health care. I'm a Medicare for all. Please let us get this one as soon as we can. It's going to be harder to do. So I've been working on um, studying this new thing, this new entity that's privatizing Medicare. So I have just a big quick update on that because if Medicare gets privatized, y'all, it's gonna make it so much harder to get single payer because it's such a big, huge, powerful chunk of money that um, the money grubbers wanna get hold of. It'll just really make our cause harder. So just real quickly, there was a program left behind by the Trump administration called DCE, Direct Contracting Entities. And uh, we worked really hard, activists did, uh, la all last year, first part of the year into the fall because the Biden administration had inherited it. This is through the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. And uh, they were studying about whether to keep it. Unfortunately, they did keep it, and it's now called ACO Reach. Think of reaching up or reaching into your pocket to get more money out of it. Um, basically, they put some pretty language around it, talking about uh, equity and all of this other stuff. But essentially, what we're so concerned about is it is a program where seniors who are in traditional Medicare, so think about your parents, your grandparents, people you know, ask them to watch for letters that come in the mail. It's putting them into, it's kind of like a Medicare Advantaged plan without their knowledge or consent, but it's called ACO REACH. Again, reach into your pocket uh, or look for direct contracting entity. Supposedly, it's not as bad under the Biden administration in that you can get out of it, but you have to go find your own primary care physician who's not in a DCE. The government will not help you do that. And just real quickly, you may, I had one of my friends say, can they do that? Can the government do that? Yes, they can. 
there is an agency within the federal government called the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. It came out of the ACO Obamacare legislation. Initially, it may have had a really good uh, intention. The idea was to try new models, although they've never tried a single payer model or a Medicare for all model, and to see if they could save money and not, um, not reduce care. Unfortunately, all of these pilot projects that have been introduced over the past 10 years, very few of them succeed and they never get rid of them. And that is how this program under the Trump administration, by the way, introduced by one of Jared Kushner's buddy, or that's already an ominous sign, and then kept by the Biden administration, has been able to get a foothold. And these programs are funded and owned by private equity firms. So it's something to watch out for. I'll close by saying, watch for, if, if you're on Medicare, traditional Medicare, watch for a letter that might come to your house. It'll tell you about this wonderful new opportunity that your primary care physician is involved with. No action is needed on your part. We all love those letters, right? I don't have to do anything, right? Uh, and then you may be put into um, like a Medicare Advantage plan and you may think it's fine, except if you have, like me, where you wanna be able to choose who your doctors are, you may find that you're now in a panel and they may not have the expert you need because as Scott pointed out, when we get older, we do get weird things, stuff starts cropping up and we want to be able to go to the doctors we want to go to, especially all of those who've struggled forever to have health insurance. When we finally get traditional Medicare, we want to believe we're home free. So that's my update. I wish I could say we made really great grounds, but we did it. There were 53 DCEs across the nation last year at this time. Now there's a 225 and climbing. And yes, there are some in Texas. Thanks. Thank you for sharing that, Linda. Uh, next, we have Kathleen Duncan. You have the floor. Thank you, um, Jeremy, and thanks for this offer. I, in addition to uh, being with uh, uh, our revolution, I have a long time volunteer with results. We are uh, creating the political will to end hunger and the worst aspects of poverty. We lobbied the members of the United States Congress as volunteers, and I work on US poverty side. And what uh, this, I'm going to take the opportunity to share with you all about um, uh, during COVID, there were several rescue packages, packages, and one of them included the child tax credit. Certainly there's a program in place it, uh, all over the country for the child tax credit that helps low income families. And uh, one of the rescue packages extended that credit and it lifted uh, 41 million children out of poverty. And the payments were from uh, August of 2021 to December 31st of December uh, of 2021. What we are asking uh, is that those extended dollars become permanent. The impact on these families uh, and the research done by Columbia University is these extra dollars, where did those dollars go? How did those families use those dollars? The number one item used by these families for this, what, um, six or seven months that Congress allotted these dollars for was for food, food. Uh, this is a very much needed program. And uh, there is uh, rumors of putting uh, Congress putting together another package, another helpful <laughs> package. And we want the, those extended dollars made permanent. It passed the House, it's stuck in the Senate and it seems to be um, dying. So thank you for letting me share that. If you ever have a chance uh, in the next couple of weeks or months to talk to Senator Cornyn or Senator Cruz, tell them, please, you expect them to accept those extra dollars. Texas kids are worth it. Thank you. 
it's so Republican to talk about cutting taxes, but as soon as it's a tax cut for a good thing, no, 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 they want to get rid of it. I swear, it blows my mind sometimes. Uh, do we have any other speakers who would like to speak for the members' minutes? All right, going once, going twice, and we're moving on. Now our next segment is our candidate's corner. This is an opportunity for anyone who's running for office. You'll have uh, one minute to speak. Uh, we'll also allow people who are surrogates for candidates if they want to speak. Uh, are there any candidates on the call currently? Uh, yes, Ms. Portia Brown. I believe one of our endorsed candidates as well. You have the floor. Thank you so much. It's so nice to be here. Uh, yes, I'm very, very proud to have been endorsed uh, for the March primary. Um, I'm just, I'm a public defender uh, every day. Things seem to be getting harder in the court work, the courtroom, but I'm hoping to bring about reforms uh, in the misdemeanor courts as much as possible. It's it's needed there as much as it's, it's needed in the felony courts, to be honest. Um, the jails don't have a section for misdemeanor people, right? So it's everyone's in there together and our jails are not getting uh, any less crowded. Uh, right now, the jails are probably about 95% full and they kind of stay at that same level uh, no matter the time of year. So uh, thank you for having me. Uh, if there's anything I can do to help out with our revolution, I'm happy to help. And thanks, thanks again for endorsing me. Uh, Ms. Brown, just so you know, you were not only just endorsed for the March primary, but you were also endorsed for our November election as well. Uh, any other candidates on the call who would like to have a minute to speak? Uh, Chuck Cruz, you have the floor. Howdy, y'all. I'm going to briefly turn on my camera. Sorry. <laughs> Howdy. Uh, Chuck Cruz. Let me see. Uh, it's probably a better camera angle right there. Yeah. All right. So run for House District 128 against Briscoe Kane, the worst legislator in the state of Texas. I uh, was out knocking doors earlier this morning with Chris. Thank you very much, Chris. And then Susan and Jamie are probably going to be out hitting doors pretty soon. And then we will also be back out tomorrow on the southern part of the district. And then just keep on rolling because we've got July 4th on Saturday. Uh, wherever you live, whatever part of Harris County you're in, there's somebody somewhere doing something. Uh, I encourage folks to get out there with your most loud uh, shirts, hats, whatever, and make sure that people know that we are here and we are pissed and we are not going to shut up. We are going to be out there fighting for our freedoms and every Texan's freedom, every American's freedom, every day, all the way to November. Thanks so much, Chuck Cruz for HD 128. Thank you, Chuck. Um, any other candidates? I do, I do see one candidate on the call. He, he's kind of sheepish. I don't know what he's waiting on. <laughs> Mr. Fulis. <laughs> Hi, y'all. Uh, I'm running for office in Brazoria County for a, a Brazoria County office, so I don't want to take too much of your time up there in Harris County from you city folk. Um, you know, hopefully you'll spend most of your time your volunteer time with with folks like chuck and uh and portia you know they can definitely use your help um if you want to throw me a few bucks in donation i would happily accept it uh, a lot of you have done that already and it's definitely helped my campaign tremendously uh, i'm putting up signs all over town right now um no one has ever seen a drainage district race like this is going to be uh so i i think we're going to get it um, we just got to keep on chugging and I will continue to give you updates, uh, but thanks for your help and, you know, hang in there. And just so our candidates know, you're welcome to share any type of uh, information from your websites, campaign donation links in the chat. Please go ahead and do so. And just so you know, since all three of our candidates who spoke uh, today are our endorsed candidates, you have the luxury of posting on our Facebook page as well. We do ask you to limit it to one post per day, uh, but if you want to share any upcoming fundraiser events, uh, GOTV activities, or any information about your campaign, you are more than welcome to share it on our Facebook page. 
Uh, I also wanted just to do a quick uh, notice to uh, Penny Shaw. She was here on the call earlier today. She had to leave for uh, another meeting. Uh, Penny Shaw is also one of our endorsed candidates who's running for uh, Texas House District 148. If you do live in her district, she does need a lot of help. She's one of the few Democrats who the Republicans are trying to gerrymander out of the House. So we please ask you um, throw your support in for Penny Shaw as well. Not only is she a support a strong progressive, but she proved that in the last legislative session. Um, just so we know, I don't think we have any more candidates, but just to be sure, last call, any more candidates who would like to speak? Going once, going twice. All right. Uh, ending off our uh, meeting. So there are a couple of uh, things we were asking. Uh, we are in need of a social media uh, guru for our revolution, Harris County. Uh, although we have a active Facebook page and we do have a YouTube page where we do post all of our meetings, uh, we are pretty lackluster when it comes to the other forms of social media. So we're asking for volunteers who would be interested in helping us getting maybe an Instagram page started. Uh, a Twitter page started. We do have a TikTok page, but I'm not going to lie, it's, it's kind of dead. Like, no one's really at running it. Uh, so, if you or anyone you know uh, is interested in helping out a local progressive organization in social media, please reach out to us at ourrevolutionharriscounty at gmail.com. Uh, we're always looking for help and we always want to try to expand our message as much as we um, we are also going to do a second round of uh, endorsements. After some discussion with the uh, steering committee, we found that there were a few races that we potentially overlooked that we want to review candidates. So, and we are also keeping an eye on third party candidates who align with our mission statement and values. So if you are interested in participating or volunteering your time in our endorsement committee, Again, please reach out to us with the same email address, ourrevolutionharriscounty at gmail.com, um, and introduce yourself. We have not started these meetings yet. We will most likely start them towards the end of July, early August at the latest. Um, but like I said, if you or anyone that you know is interested in helping out, please do so. Uh, please join us for our next meeting, which is going to be on August 6th at 2 o'clock. Uh, we are trying to go back in person. Now, if you were with us last month, we were at Midtown Bar and Grill. Uh, due to some uh, complications, uh, we thought that it was best to do a virtual meeting this month, but we do want to go back in person. Um, we are still in lookout of a location to meet all of our requirements. So please follow us on Facebook or join our mailing list for more information. We will let everyone know where that location will be as well. If you use QR code on the screen, you can sign up through our mobilized link where you can automatically sign up and you can get automatic updates about all upcoming meetings. We promise we won't spam you and I can 100% guarantee we do not share your information with any third party. You're safe with us. We also want to promote our sister chapters meeting, Brazoria and Fort Bend. There will be meeting always Saturday after us, so their next meeting is going to be on July 9th. Uh, you can scan the QR code for their mobilized link to find out location and time. Um, Scott, could you help remind me where the location of the meeting is? I forgot. West Pearland Library. West Pearland Library. Apparently a new library in the area. Everyone's super excited about it. So uh, please help support our sister chapter by joining it, especially if you live in either Fort Bend or Brazoria, or if you know anyone who lives in Fort Bend and Brazoria County to join. It. Uh, these are our links to our social media sites. Please follow us on Facebook. Uh, follow and watch our videos on YouTube. Heck, you can even play the video and walk away. Apparently, the longer someone watches a video, apparently it makes it more, like it pops up more in people's stream. I didn't know that. A little interesting fact when you start your own YouTube page. Uh, and if you are active on TikTok and possibly would like to uh, be in control of our TikTok account, uh, we also are, uh, we have our TikTok handle here as well. 
Uh, we want to also thank everybody for joining our meeting today. Um, that will be all that we will be sharing. Um, thank you for all showing up. We do appreciate it. Um, and um, I guess, yeah. Uh, unless anyone wants to say some final words, I guess this is it for today. I'll take that as a goodbye. All right. A great meeting. I hope everyone enjoy it. Y'all enjoy your afternoon. Enjoy your 4th of July weekend. No matter how much independence they're trying to take away from us, we still have to fight. All right. Goodbye, everyone. Big love, everybody. <clears throat> Bye, everybody. <laughs>